If I started murdering people, there'd be none of you left. 2019, a rock's supposed to hit you anyhow. You're all gonna get nuked. Remember when we were kids scared of monsters under our beds? Turns out reality strikes harder. As we grow older, we discover that some real life monsters are far scarier than anything from our wildest imaginations. And today, we'll explore 10 seriously disturbing interviews with evil people. Number 1. Gerard John Schaefer March 26, 1946, marked the birthday of Gerard John Schaefer in Wisconsin. His early life displayed concerning behavior, from tormenting animals to showing a fascination with violence. As Schaefer grew older, his behavior only became more erratic. He dropped out of college and struggled to find his place in the world, hopping from one job to another. Surprisingly, in 1972, he joined the Martin County Sheriff's Office in Florida, seemingly finding his calling. However, things quickly took a turn for the worse. Once Schaefer became a cop, his personality seemed to change. He became increasingly controlling and abusive, particularly towards women. Some of his fellow officers even reported that he would exploit his position of power to manipulate women into doing him favors. 1973. Schaefer's violent tendencies escalated when he pulled over two young female hitchhikers. He exploited his authority to convince them hitchhiking was illegal and offered them a ride, only to take them to a secluded area where he intended to murder them. Thankfully, a police radio call disrupted his plans, and the girls managed to escape. But Schaefer's crimes didn't end there. Just two months later, he abducted and killed two more female hitchhikers, burying their bodies in a wooded area. Despite denying the allegations, Schaefer was eventually convicted of two counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison in 1973. During interviews in prison, Schaefer often portrayed himself as a victim of a biased justice system, claiming his innocence. In one interview, when asked about the number of women he was accused of killing, he responded with a smug smile, saying, I was accused of originally, originally accused of killing 34 women, but nobody has ever managed to come up with 34 names, jurisdictions, or anything else. You could see the pride on his face as he talked about his legacy and the fact that the police couldn't convict him of anything more than two murders. While in prison, Schaefer even became acquainted with fellow serial killer Ted Bundy and claimed that they often argued about who was the better killer. He even gloated in an interview, stating that he was indeed better than Bundy. I'm the best, Ted. You're gonna fry, and I'm gonna be here, and I'll be the best, just like they said. December 3rd, 1995, Schaefer was brutally stabbed to death on the floor of his prison cell. He had been stabbed over 40 times. It appears that justice finally caught up with him in the end. And now let's turn our attention to his buddy, Ted Bundy. Number 2. Ted Bundy November 24, 1946, one of America's most notorious figures was born in Burlington, Vermont, Ted Bundy. Bundy was super intelligent, charismatic, and good-looking, all traits he used to lure his victims and gain their trust. He would pretend to be injured and desperate for help, and these poor women would fall for it. Bundy's killing spree began in 1974. His modus operandi was to bludgeon his victims with blunt objects, strangle them, and assault their corpses. He became a person of interest for the first time when a woman named Carol DeRanch managed to escape his clutches. August 16, 1975, Bundy was finally arrested, not for the kidnapping, but for speeding. During the search of his Volkswagen, the officers discovered a collection of burglary tools including a crowbar, handcuffs, and a rope. Bundy was then arrested for possession. A little did anyone know at the time that this arrest would be just the tip of the iceberg. Following his arrest, Bundy was identified as the man who had attempted to kidnap DeRanch. As a result, he was sentenced to 15 years behind bars. Meanwhile, the police were diligently working to connect him to even more heinous crimes in Washington, Colorado, and Utah. But Bundy wasn't one to be easily contained. June 1977, while acting as his own attorney during his murder trial for killing a young woman in Colorado, he made a daring escape by leaping out of a window of the courthouse library. 
Although he managed to evade capture for eight days, he was eventually apprehended. December 30th, 1977, Bundy made his second escape. This time he crafted a hole in the ceiling of his cell and lost over 30 pounds to squeeze through it. Authorities didn't discover his disappearance for 15 hours, giving him a significant head start on his journey to Florida. January 14, 1978 Bundy broke into the Chai Omega sorority house at Florida State University. He attacked four young women, resulting in two deaths and leaving the other two in critical condition. February 9th, he kidnapped and killed 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. Later that same month, he was pulled over by the police while driving a stolen car again for speeding. January 24th, 1989, justice had finally caught up with him and he was executed after spending nine years on death row. Bundy gave many interviews while he was in prison. The first one was when he was representing himself, and at that time, he was vehemently maintaining his innocence. <laughs> does, that, does that include the time I stole a comic book when I was five years old? <laughs> I'm not guilty of the charges which have been filed against me. He smiles a lot during the interview, displaying a body language that appears relaxed and almost happy. But fast forward to the night before his execution, and we see a fearful and pensive man. Sometimes I feel very tranquil, and other times I don't feel tranquil at all. During that interview, he also confessed to his crimes and claimed that he had developed violent and destructive feelings that eventually led him to act upon him. Uh, again, uh, I, uh, another factor here that I haven't mentioned is the use of alcohol, but I think that what alcohol did. And now that we're done with Bundy, let's move on to the man he helped put in prison. Number 3. Gary Ridgway February 18, 1949, Ridgway was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. He had a pretty normal childhood, all things considered, but when he was 15, he decided to stab a young boy just to see how stabbing worked. Despite his dark tendencies, Ridgway managed to put on a facade of normalcy for quite some time. After finishing high school at 20 and serving in the U.S. Navy for a couple of years, he settled in Seattle. Little did anyone know that this seemingly ordinary guy was about to embark on a murderous rampage. Soon after Ridgway moved to Seattle, he started getting into trouble with the law. He got arrested for allegedly choking a worker and for solicitation. And as the years went by, his crimes only got worse. It's widely believed that his killing spree began in 1982, starting with a 16-year-old girl who had run away from her foster home. Gary had a knack for targeting vulnerable runaways and sex workers. He'd pick them up at truck stops and dive bars along Highway 99 outside Seattle. To gain their trust, he'd show them pictures of his own son. Sick, right? When I opened up my wallet, there would be a picture of my son and toys, eight-year-old toys on the, on the dash. See that? And I would or any big defenses. This sentiment is undeniably one of the most unrepentant that takes the spotlight in all his interviews. And after Ridgway would lure his victims into his car, he would dump their bodies in wooded areas around the Green River, earning himself the nickname the Green River Killer. And by the time he was done, Ridgway had taken the lives of 49 women, although he eventually confessed to a total of 71 murders. When the bodies were still piling up, the King County Sheriff's Office formed the Green River Task Force to catch this monster. And guess who they went to for help? None other than Ted Bundy. That's right, investigators used Bundy's knowledge of serial killing to create a profile of Ridgway. Turns out Bundy's theories were spot on and the police were able to use him to collect samples and provide evidence for an arrest warrant. Ridgway was arrested in 2001, and unlike some other infamous serial killers, he's still alive today. He's currently 74 years old and is expected to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Number 4. Otis Toole March 5, 1947, Otis Toole was born in Jacksonville, Florida. He entered this world into a deeply disturbing home environment. His mother was a Christian extremist. His older sister molested him and dressed him in women's clothing. And his grandmother was a Satanist. 
who used him to rob graves of body parts for satanic rituals. Now, to make matters worse, Tool's father subjected him to unspeakable acts at the behest of his male friends before abandoning him. With an IQ of 75 and a lack of positive influences in his life, Tool seemed destined for a dark and troubled path. When Tool reached the ninth grade, he dropped out of school and began frequenting local gay bars. He later revealed to reporters that he had realized his homosexuality at the tender age of 10. At 14, a local salesman asked him to perform sexual acts on him, leading to Tool murdering this man by running him over with his own car. This gruesome act marked the beginning of Tool's aimless wanderings across the United States. During his travels, fate brought him face to face with a man named Henry Lee Lucas. The two formed a twisted bond, becoming both friends and lovers, embarking on a chilling murder spree together. Although Tool and Lucas were inseparable and typically committed their heinous acts as a team, Tool's downfall came when he set fire to the home of a man he claimed to have a romantic involvement with. This incident, coupled with his numerous prior arrests, resulted in a 20-year prison sentence. Soon after, the authorities apprehended Lucas for unlawful possession of a firearm. DNA evidence eventually linked him to multiple murders across the country, resulting in Tool's conviction for six of these crimes. Tool was initially sentenced to death, but his sentence was later commuted to life in prison. September 15, 1996, he passed away at the age of 49. Tool loved to talk and boast about his crimes whenever given a chance. Prior to his death, Tool shockingly confessed to nearly 100 murders, including the kidnapping and murder of Adam, the son of John Walsh, the creator and host of America's Most Wanted show. He was interviewed in prison, and his explosive bursts of laughter and chilling smile throughout the interview made it the stuff of nightmares. What do you prefer in life? Uh, sex or fire? Well, I know. <laughs> I like to say a whole, a whole city burned down. Number 5. Susan Atkins. May 7th, 1948. Susan Atkins was born to middle-class parents. She grew up in Northern California. Her parents were alcoholics, and she later claimed that a male relative sexually abused her. When she was 15, Susan's mother died of cancer. Out on her own, Susan Atkins joined two convicts, participated in several robberies, and spent a few months in prison in Oregon. And at 19, Susan fell in love with Charles Manson. The minute she met him in San Francisco, she loved him so much that she obeyed his orders to kill. With nothing to lose and nowhere to go, Susan settled with Manson at Spawn Ranch outside LA. She officially became part of the family and set out on a path that was irreversible, leading to some of the most heinous crimes in history. Susan Atkins' quest for love and belonging spiraled into a life of murder. By July 1969, Susan was a trusted member of Manson's inner circle, and he took her and two others with him to shake down a man named Gary Hinman for money. Now, when Hinman wouldn't comply, Manson slashed his face with a sword and left, and the remaining three later beat and killed him. By this point, Manson's visions of a race war were propelling his every move, and he had a bizarre plan to instigate it by murdering people in their homes and blaming it on the Black Panthers. August 8, 1969, Manson sent four of his followers, including Susan, to the house of director Roman Polanski and the pregnant Sharon Tate. By the end of the night, Tate and four others in the house were dead. Susan later admitted to holding Tate down while a fellow member stabbed her to death. In Atkins' grand jury testimony in 1969, she recalls saying to Tate, who pleaded for her life and the life of her unborn baby, Woman, I have no mercy for you. Nothing. I got absolutely nothing for her. Um, and she begged for her life and for the life of the baby. Before they left the house, Susan wanted to do something that would shock the world. Using a towel dipped in Tate's blood, she wrote the word, pig. A couple of days later, Susan accompanied four other members to the home of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca, who were all brutally murdered by the Manson family as well. 
October 1969, the entire Manson family was arrested and later tried for the murders. In prison, Susan pulled the string loose to the rest of the Manson killings and even boasted to her cellmates that she was the one who killed Sharon Tate and tasted her blood. Initially sentenced to death, the abolition of the California death penalty condemned Susan to life in prison. She became a born-again Christian and married twice. September 24, 2009, Susan Atkins dies in prison. Susan gave several interviews over the years describing her involvement in the assassinations in graphic detail. Down every house, hit every house, on the, on the street, on the street yes. and kill all the people kill in those houses. As you can see, her hair is perfectly coiffed and she's calm, collected, and clearly prepared for this interview, during which not one tear was shed for the lives she helped destroy. Not one. I remember when we first went in, um, one of the people said, who are you? And texted, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. And now that we've wrapped up the chapter on Susan Atkins, let's shift our focus to the man who shaped her into the person she became. Number 6. Charles Manson November 12, 1934, one of America's scariest men was born in Cincinnati to a 16-year-old girl who was both an alcoholic and a prostitute. 1951, still just a teenager, Charles Manson began spending time in prison. He would eventually spend half of the first 32 years of his life behind bars. When he wasn't incarcerated, he also attended reform schools. Probation reports described Manson as suffering from a marked degree of rejection, instability, and psychic trauma, and constantly striving for status and securing some kind of love. His various offenses included pimping and passing stolen checks, and in 1961, he was sent to McNeil Island Prison in Washington State for 10 years. March 21, 1967, he was released from prison and moved to San Francisco where he began recruiting for his family. The family was a group of around 100 followers of Manson, who shared his passion for an unconventional lifestyle and habitual use of hallucinogenic drugs. And they all believed without question Manson's claims that he was Jesus and his prophecies of a race war. The Manson family is thought to have carried out some 35 murders. Most of their cases were never tried for lack of evidence. Yet the perpetrators were all sentenced to life for brutally killing seven people. Ironically, Manson and his family were arrested not on suspicion of the Tate-LaBianca murders, but simply on the belief that they had vandalized a portion of Death Valley National Park while hiding out in the Mojave Desert. 1969, the county sheriff had taken him into custody, not realizing they were involved in these heinous murders. But with the confession of Susan Atkins, while held in detention on suspicion of murdering Gary Hinman, is what led detectives to realize that Manson and his followers were involved in the killings. Various motivations were examined during the course of the trial. The most feasible was that Manson's pathological ego, insanity, and belief in Armageddon were influences that led him to leave behind a trail of destruction. Manson believed that he was the new messiah, and that after a nuclear attack, he and his followers would be saved by hiding in a secret world under the desert. January 25, 1971, Manson was convicted of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death, which was automatically commuted to life in prison after California's Supreme Court invalidated all death sentences. Manson gave many interviews from prison. All can be used as evidence for the man's obviously unhinged persona. These interviews are guaranteed to send chills down your spine. For example, when asked if he ever expressed remorse, he lashed out and said, Remorse for what? You people have done everything in the world to me. Doesn't that give me equal right? I can do anything I want to you people at any time I want to, because that's what you've done to me. You know, if I wanted to kill somebody, I'd take this book and beat you to death with it, and I wouldn't feel a thing. November 15, 2017, Manson died from cardiac arrest, resulting from respiratory failure and colon cancer. He was 83 years old, and to his very last day, his biggest regret was not killing enough people. I should have killed four or five hundred people, then I would have felt better. 
Then when I felt like I really offered society something. Number seven, Edmund Kemper. December 18th, 1948, Ed Kemper was born in Burbank, California, and he displayed troubling behavior from a very young age. The future serial killer had a turbulent childhood. His mother, Clarnell, was an alcoholic with borderline personality disorder. She constantly belittled and insulted him, crushing his self-esteem by telling him no woman would ever love him. Ed also used to force his sisters to participate in disturbing games like electric chair and gas chamber. It's like he was already envisioning his own dark future. When he was 10, Ed's disturbing behavior escalated to violence. After his father left the family in 1957, the young boy killed both of their cats. He went so far as to bury one of them alive and later decapitated it. By the time he turned 14, Ed ran away from his mom's house to live with his father. However, his father had already remarried and sent him to live with his grandparents instead. It was there with his grandparents that Ed Kemper would become a killer for the first time. August 27, 1964, Ed found himself in an explosive argument with his grandmother. In a fit of rage, he shot her in the head using his grandfather's 22 caliber rifle. As his grandfather approached the house, Ed shot him as well. He later confessed that he just wanted to know what it felt like to kill grandma. He also said he killed his grandfather to prevent him from discovering his wife's murder. Following these horrific acts, Ed was sent to a criminally insane hospital. It was there that doctors diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, along with an impressively high IQ. Despite the severity of his crimes, Ed Kemper only remained in the hospital for a few years. 1969, on his 21st birthday, he finally got released. Ed then moved in with his mother. Once he was free again, it didn't take long for Ed to give in to his murderous desires. May 7, 1972, he picked up two Fresno State students near Berkeley, California. Ed took the women to a nearby wooded area with the intention of assaulting them. However, he panicked and ended up stabbing and choking both women. This marked the beginning of Kemper's killing spree. April 20th, 1973, for his last act, Ed brutally bludgeoned his mother to death with a claw hammer while she was sleeping. He then decapitated her and even assaulted her severed head. He then drove to Colorado, fully expecting to see news reports about the murder. However, after not hearing anything for a while, Ed ended up calling the police from a phone booth and confessed to everything. Ed Kemper was arrested and later found guilty on eight counts of first-degree murder. He attempted suicide twice and even asked for the death penalty, but ultimately received seven concurrent life sentences instead. Edmund Kemper gave many interviews from prison and even helped the FBI better understand the psyche of serial killers. It started with surrogates at a non-human level. Physical objects, my possessions, other people's destruction of things that are cared about, and then destruction of things that are living on a lower level, small animals, uh, insects, animals, and then finally people. Ed admitted that his mother had been his real target the entire time, and he killed a certain type of woman because they represented what his mother was, what she was like, and what was important to her. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her. Number 8. Eileen Wuornos February 29, 1956, one of America's most notorious female serial killers came into the world. Eileen's life would have been a perfect blueprint if a psychologist had been tasked with creating a childhood that would inevitably lead to a serial killer. Eileen stumbled upon prostitution at a young age, exchanging favors for cigarettes and other treats while still in elementary school. Of course, she didn't stumble upon this lifestyle on her own. Her father, a convicted sex offender, and her mother, a Finnish immigrant, had already abandoned her by that point, leaving her in the care of her grandparents. However, after a domestic incident erupted between her and her grandfather, Eileen was left to fend for herself in the woods outside of Troy, Michigan. She briefly served time for armed robbery, where she stole a measly $35 and some cigarettes. Returning to her life as a prostitute, Eileen was arrested again, 
Eileen was arrested in 1986 after a customer reported that she had pulled a gun on him in the car and demanded money. In 1987, she found companionship with Tyria Moore, a hotel maid who would eventually become her lover and partner in crime. Eileen provided conflicting accounts of her murders. Sometimes she claimed to have been the victim of an assault or attempted assault by each of the men she killed. Other times, she admitted that her motive was robbery. Depending on who she was talking to, her story would change. Together, the two of them went on to kill six men before Eileen was apprehended on a warrant after a brawl in a biker bar in Volusia County, Florida. By this time, Tyria had already left her and was later caught by the police in Pennsylvania, just a day after Eileen's arrest. It didn't take long for Tyria to turn on Eileen. Right after her arrest, she was back in Florida, staying at a motel that police had rented for her. She started making calls to Eileen, hoping to get a confession that could be used against her. During these calls, Tyria acted like she was scared that the police would blame her for all the murders. She begged Eileen to go over the story again step by step so they could get their story straight. After four days of constant phone calls unbeknownst to her, Eileen Wernos confessed to several murders. With this confession, the authorities finally had what they needed to arrest Eileen Wernos for murder. She was ultimately sentenced to death. Life had been tough for her outside of prison, but it seemed like she was having an even harder time inside. Eileen started to believe that her food was being tampered with, like someone was spitting on it or contaminating it with bodily fluids. She went on hunger strikes, refusing to eat meals prepared while certain people were in the jail's kitchen. In 2001, she directly asked the court to speed up her sentence. She claimed that she was living in abusive and inhumane conditions and even said that her body was being attacked by some kind of sonic weapon. And they had the intercom on in the room and they kept lying that it wasn't on and they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Now this interview took place on the eve of Eileen's execution and it was pretty unsettling for several reasons. It's evident from her demeanor how mentally unstable she is and you can't help but stare back at her eyes as she accuses the police of railroading and sabotage. Cops knew who I was after Richard Mallory died. I left prints everywhere and they covered it up and let me kill the rest of those guys to turn me into a serial killer. June 6th, 2002, Eileen Wernos got her wish when she was finally put to death. I'm okay, God is gonna be there. Jesus Christ is gonna be there, all the angels and everything. Number 9. Richard Ramirez February 29th, 1960, Richard Ramirez, aka the Night Stalker, entered the world in El Paso, Texas. Growing up, Ramirez endured physical abuse from his father and suffered multiple head injuries at a young age. To escape his violent father, Ramirez sought solace in the company of his older cousin, Miguel, a Vietnam veteran. However, Miguel's influence proved to be just as detrimental as his father's. During his time in Vietnam, Miguel committed heinous acts, assaulting, torturing, and even dismembering several Vietnamese women. He would even show young Richie photos of the horrors he inflicted upon these innocent victims. At the tender age of 13, Ramirez witnessed his cousin fatally shoot his own wife. This traumatic event marked a turning point in his life, transforming him from a frightened and abused boy into a hardened and brooding young man. June 28, 1984 marked the date of Ramirez's first murder. He brutally killed 79-year-old Jenny Vincow, stabbing and assaulting her. March 17, 1985, Richard Ramirez struck again with an attack on Maria Hernandez in her home. Though Hernandez managed to escape, her roommate Dale Okazaki was not so lucky. But Ramirez wasn't finished yet. Later that same night, he shot and killed another victim. A little over a week later, Ramirez murdered Vincent Zazara, 64, and his wife Maxine, 44. This was when Ramirez established his signature attack style, shooting and killing the husband, then a and stabbing the wife. For months, Ramirez continued to stalk and murder more victims in California. One of the most terrifying aspects of Ramirez was his willingness to kill anyone who crossed his path. Unlike other serial killers who have specific targets, Richard Ramirez murdered both men and women, young and old. 
Not only that, but many of his attacks had a satanic element. Ramirez would carve pentagrams into the victims' bodies in some cases. In others, he would force them to swear their love for Satan. Ultimately, it was Richard's own mistake that led to his capture. After being spotted outside a witness's house, he accidentally left a footprint behind and abandoned his car with the license plate in plain sight. When the police discovered the vehicle, they found just enough of a fingerprint to make a match. Thanks to that new computer database of fingerprints, the LAPD was able to identify Richard Ramirez and released his photo to the public. By pure chance, Ramirez happened to be traveling back to LA when his photo was released. So he didn't realize that he was being tracked down until he returned to the city and saw his own face plastered across the newspapers. Despite his attempts to escape the police, the local residents who recognized him managed to corner him. They gave him a good beating until the police finally closed in. Following his arrest, Ramirez was found guilty of 13 counts of murder. As a result, he was sentenced to the gas chamber for his heinous crimes. Throughout his life, the Night Stalker never showed any remorse for his despicable acts. In fact, he seemed to revel in his notoriety, finding pleasure in his infamy. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. Ramirez spent the rest of his life in San Quentin State Prison, but he never faced execution. Instead, Ramirez met his end in 2013 due to complications from B-cell lymphoma. Serial killers do on a small scale what governments do on a large one. They are a product of the times, and these are bloodthirsty times. And number 10, Issei Sagawa. April 26th, 1949, in Kobe, Japan, a man named Issei Sagawa was born. This man would grow up to become the infamous Kobe Cannibal, a Japanese murderer who committed a shocking crime in France but managed to escape the clutches of justice. From a young age, Sagawa had some seriously twisted cravings, a fascination with eating human flesh. He sought out fairy tales involving humans being eaten. His favorite was Hansel and Gretel. Even recalls noticing classmates' thighs in first grade and thinking, that looks delicious. He blamed the media's representation of Western women like Grace Kelly for sparking his cannibalistic fantasies, equating it with what most people would call sexual desire. 1977, Sagawa moved to Paris to study literature at the Sorbonne. Once there, he said his cannibalistic urges took over. And eventually, he found the, in his eyes, perfect victim, Rene Hartfelt a Dutch student who crossed paths with him at the Sarbonne. As they got to know each other, he cunningly invited her over for dinner, slowly gaining her trust, but only if she knew that she was getting close to a predator with a taste for something darker than the worst nightmares. One attempt wasn't enough for Sagawa. He tried to kill her once but failed when the gun misfired. He tried again the very next night. This time the gun fired, and Renee was killed in an instant. Now what happened next is too gruesome to spell out here. Sagawa's actions with Renee's lifeless body was the stuff of nightmares. And believe it or not, his only regret was not eating her while she was still alive. Try to think of anything more horrifying than that. Trying to dispose of the evidence, Sagawa headed to a park with suitcases containing what remained of Renee's body. But fate had other plans for him. People noticed the suitcases dripping blood and alerted the French police. During questioning, Sagawa didn't dance around the truth with chilling nonchalance. He had admitted that he killed her to eat her flesh. He say awaited his trial for two years in a French prison. When it was finally time for his trial, a French judge declared him legally insane and unfit to stand trial, dropping the charges and ordering him to be held indefinitely in a mental institution. They then deported him back to Japan, where he was supposed to spend the rest of his days in a Japanese mental hospital. But our story doesn't end there. Since the French court documents were sealed and kept secret, the Japanese authorities couldn't build a case against Sagawa and had no choice but to set him free. August 12th, 1986, Sagawa checked himself out of the psychiatric hospital he was in. Now you would think he'd disappear into the shadows, but no, Sagawa somehow managed to turn his crime into a sick form of fame. Becoming a minor celebrity in Japan, 
He appeared on talk shows, wrote manga novels that glorified his gruesome acts, and lived off the notoriety that should have condemned him. And in a jaw-dropping interview with Vice, Sagawa coldly recounts the calculated shooting and devouring of Rene, displaying not an ounce of remorse on his face. Sagawa even said that he wasn't cured and would like to taste human flesh again before he died, but unfortunately, he never got that chance. November 24th, 2022. Sagawa died of pneumonia and was given a funeral attended only by relatives. たった